now, without further ado, I'm so excited to introduce our moderator for today's event, Stephen Howard. At DePaul University, Stephen was first the first and last member of the men's basketball team to be named first team all and first team academic all American and a senior in the prestigious Anson Mount Scholar Athlete Award, which is given annually to the nation's premier scholar athlete. Stephen played four years in the NBA for the Seattle Supersonics, San Antonio Spurs, and the Utah Jazz. After the NBA, Stephen played in 12 different countries, including France, Spain, China, and Israel, immersing himself in the unique cultures of Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. He then joined ESPN as a college basketball analyst and Fox Sports as the studio analyst for the NBA's Oklahoma City Thunder and the New Orleans Pelicans. Stephen has a master's in organizational leadership and speaks to adults and youth around the globe about channeling their inner leader, setting their minds on success, and the lessons that come from overcoming adversity in his speech titled, Lead or Lose, How to Lead, Inspire, and Impact the World. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Stephen. Thank you, Emily. I am honored and um, really excited to be a part of this whole event. I want to touch a little bit on Coach Stubblefield's journey to DePaul, where he was known as we named, as we all know, the head basketball coach in April of 2021. Coach Stubblefield comes to DePaul after spending the last 11 seasons at Oregon and has over two decades of experience in college basketball and is regarded as one of the nation's top recruiters. Most recently, Stubblefield served on the staff at Oregon for the last 11 seasons. He helped the Ducks to 10 postseason appearances that included eight NCAA tournament bursts. The eight NCAA bursts saw Oregon reach the Final Four once and Elite Eight once, along with three other Sweet 16 appearances. In Coach Stubblefield's 11 seasons, Oregon won back-to-back -back regular season Pac-12 championships that followed the 2018-19 team that won the Pac-12 tournament title. Overall, the Ducks added four regular season conference championships and three conference tournament championships to the trophy case in Coach Stubblefield's 11 seasons. Coach Stubblefield assisted in multiple nationally ranked recruiting classes, which included five recruit recruiting classes ranked in the top 12 nationally since the 2016 season and including the 2021 season. Coach Stubblefield has worked under two of the best coaches in the country with Mick Cronin at Cincinnati and then Dana Altman at Oregon. Prior to Oregon, Stubblefield spent four seasons as an assistant coach at the University of Cincinnati. He, he was also on the staff at New Mexico State, UT Arlington, UT San Antonio, and at his alma mater, Nebraska, Omaha. So from a fan's perspective, Coach Stubblefield can coach, recruit, and develop players. From a player's perspective, he's been a part of an exciting brand of basketball in the past that has won, and last but not least, he can get players into the league. One interesting little note about Coach Stubblefield is since he was named the basketball coach for the DePaul Blue Demons, he has not gone back to Eugene. One interesting note, he has seen your boy in Dallas, so I feel really special because he hadn't gone home to get his stuff. He stayed in Chicago, gone on the recruiting trail, as we've seen multiple uh, new additions to the team. So without further ado, I want to introduce the hardest working man in college basketball right now, Coach Ton Tony Stubblefield, the new coach of the DePaul Blue Demons. How you doing, Coach? I'm good, Stephen. I appreciate the kind words. Um, excited to be here. It's been a whirlwind for about the last month and a half, but it's been a great experience so far and just really excited and ready to get to work. Well, I mean, it seems like you, you got to work right after – the press conference introducing you. How has this whole experience uh, been going for you? Well, you know, I tell you what, Stephen. So we had the press conference, I want to say it was on a Wednesday, and I was supposed to actually go back to Eugene that Sunday and kind of get situated for the move. And you're right, I haven't been back to Eugene, Oregon since the press conference, but hey, you know, it's, it's time to get to work. You know, there's work to be done, and I can always get moved here over the course of the summer. And, and, you know, we're getting situated with that and that will happen, but it's been great. It's been great. Obviously it's a lot of work, but getting a chance to meet some of the former, you know, players, the guys that were on the current team and um, just getting to know them and just getting to know everything about the Paul Chicago and familiarizing myself more with the city, which I was obviously familiar with Chicago, but just getting up to speed with everything. Well, nice little segue to my next question. And, and I think I speak for all Blue Demon fans and former Blue Demon athletes. 
uh, you brought in a, an exciting and a, a lot of energy to the program. How have you adjusted to Chicago? Um, anything interesting that you've uh, <laughs> kind of stumbled upon or how has your experience been? It's been great. Um, obviously, Chicago is a great city. Speaks for itself. Um, there's a lot to do here. It's great energy in the city. Um, great people. So, you know, adjusting Chicago has not been um, a hard move for me whatsoever. So it's been great. Lincoln Park is a great area. Um, DePaul is a great university. So just, you know, being in Lincoln Park, um, all the activity, um, runners, joggers, just it's just, you know, it's a, it's a lot to like about it. So again, it's, it's been a great adjustment for me. Um, a little too much eating, but we'll, we'll, we'll get into that more. But uh, it's been nothing but positive so far. And I'm really happy to be here. Coach, not everyone like Myself is fortunate enough to have, you know, seen your career and, and you know, touched paths on the recruiting trail while I was covering ESPN. And they might not know really your background. Uh, it's, it's, it's an impressive one. And you've learned from two of the top coaches uh, in college basketball with Dana Altman, Mick Cronin. Can you give a little uh, insight into, you know, your coaching background and things that you've learned and experienced throughout your tenure and your journey to DePaul? You know, Stephen, you know, finishing up my playing career at Nebraska Omaha um, is really when I, you know, decided that I really wanted to get into coaching. You know, my junior and senior year during the summers, you know, I spent the summers working basketball camps. So I would go all over working college basketball camps from really June to the end of August and working with young men. And that's really when my passion that, you know, I kind of knew which direction I wanted to go once I graduated. And I really enjoyed hosting recruits when they would come on campus for visits, getting to know them, their families. And it was something that I really took a liking to. So, you know, when my career was over, um, I was fortunate enough to be able to stay on and work as like a student manager, a GA. And that's what I did to start my career. And I was fortunate enough to work for a guy by the name of Tim Carter and for one year. And then he got the job at the University of Texas, San Antonio. So he offered me a full-time coaching position at the young age of 23. And um, so I, I, I got kind of brought up in the coaching ranks really fast. As, you, know, I, you know, I didn't get a chance to coach high school or, you know, start at a young age. I was a Division I full-time assistant at 23. So there was a lot that I had to learn right away. So that was a great experience for me. Um, being in Texas, a, such a large state, and just getting – beginning to build my network of people, of high school coaches and AAU coaches in that state really proved to be very beneficial for me down the road. So I, you know, I started at Texas San Antonio, um, went to the University of Texas Arlington, right outside of Dallas, and um, was there six years and worked for Eddie McCarter, who was a great coach who I learned a great deal from. And again, th those were days where you really had to really want to coach, you know, for you to have to drive in the car you know, 10, 11 hours to go see a young man play and then, you know, drive back home that same night. You really had to have a passion for this. So, and, you know, not making a whole lot of money at the same time, but it was something that I really enjoyed doing um, and getting to know the kids, their pa parents and their families. So that was important to me. And then I transitioned there to work for a legendary coach in Lou Henson at New Mexico State. And I just learned so much from Coach Henson as far as treating people, players, um, the game of basketball, just all the knowledge that he had. And what really helped me with Lou Henson as well is, you know, him coming from the University of Illinois, wanting to recruit the Midwest, recruiting Chicago still. Obviously, his name was big in this area. So, you know, it got a chance to bring me back to the Midwest, develop a lot of relationships in the Chicago area because um, we probably had seven or eight guys on our team from Chicago at New Mexico State. So worked for Coach um, Henson, um, worked for Reggie Theus one year at New Mexico State. So, again, yeah, that was a great learning experience for me. Then went to Cincinnati to work for Mick Cronin. And at the time, they were making the transition from Bob Huggins to a new coach. So, you know, there was a lot of turmoil in the program. You know, obviously, Coach Huggins had built a great program at Cincinnati, but things had kind of fallen off. And they were transitioning from Conference USA to the Big East at the same time DePaul was. So that was a major transition. But 
you know, we got that program off the ground. You know, when we took the job, our first team meeting at Cincinnati, there was one player. So, you know, it, it was a definitely a total rebuild. And again, it took some time, but, you know, Coach Cronin really got that program going. Obviously now he's at UCLA, but again, that's really when I learned how to build a program and everything that it took to build a program. So Coach Cronin really helped me with that in my career. Then obviously spending the last 11 years at the University of Oregon, working for Dana Altman, which has been a great experience for me, was a great experience. And again, you know, I left one rebuild situation at, at Cincinnati to go into another one at Oregon. But, you know, I looked forward to that challenge. And I knew that, you know, the, the potential of getting that program turned around at Oregon and the resources that they had in place. And I knew it could be done. And, you know, thankfully, we were able to get that done. And um, we had great success there, obviously, going to a Final Four, going to a couple of Elite Eights, um, winning some Pac-12 championships. So I had a really a great situation at Oregon. You know, I stayed there 11 years, which, you know, when I took that job, I would have never thought I was going to stay at the University of Oregon 11 years. And again, I had opportunities at some um, Division One head coaching jobs that I just didn't think was the right fit for me. And obviously, you know, other assistant jobs at high level programs. But, you know, there was no way I was going to leave Oregon and what we had built at that time to go somewhere else and be an assistant coach. You know, my next move, I wanted to be a head coach. But again, I wanted to be the right program, the right fit for me. And um, fortunately, I'm here at the par today. And that kind of gives you a little insight, a little bit of my background and how I kind of came up in this business. Well, one of the things that impressed me um, before I even met you is that I've had multiple former guys that you didn't even coach. And, you know, you talk about, you know, taking over at Cincinnati after Hall of Fame coach Bob Huggins left. I mean, that's really difficult to do. And I had, I had guys that played for Coach Huggs that reached out to me um, that said, hey, you got a good one and Coach Stubblefield. And for me, that spoke volumes because we've had multiple coaches since I left DePaul in 92. And there hasn't been that, um, that kind of unifying vision for our program. And so to have a, a guy that you didn't even coach to reach out and say, you got a good one, um, kind of shows to me that community that you built and you helped establish at the University of Cincinnati. So I, I was really impressed with that. Um, we all know that, you know, for a, anything great to occur, you have to have a vision. And along with that, for any uh, great program, you have to start with the vision. So what would you say your vision is for DePaul men's basketball? Well, you know, you, you, you do have to have a vision, and, and I do have a vision coming into this. And, again, my vision is, you know, success on and off the court. You know, number one, I want young men that want to get an education. Um, obviously, you can get a great quality education at DePaul. So that's first and foremost of young men coming here um, with the desire to get a degree. And I want young men to come here and receive that degree and get a great education here at the same time. My vision, you know, to be very honest and blunt with you, is winning championships at DePaul. You know, getting up on that ladder and cutting down the nets and having great success here. And um, that's why I'm so excited about this opportunity and the potential that's here because I really know in my heart that it can be done. And again, Stephen, you know, it's things that, that have been done at DePaul. Um, now, it's, it's been a while since some things have been done. But the proof is in the pudding that, you know, you can have great success here on and off the court. Um, it's a great program that's had great tradition. Um, it's a great city to recruit to. Um, you're playing in a great league in the Big East. So there's a lot to sell. But my vision is having young men walk across that stage, get a degree, and playing for championships on a year-in and year-out basis and playing deep into the NCAA tournament. That's really where I think this program can go. Things are in place to get there. You know, we're going to have to roll up our sleeves and work very tirelessly to do that. But I understand what that takes. You know, I've been at a couple of programs where we had to get it started that way. So that doesn't scare me by any means. Um, there's great talent in the area, in the state of Illinois. Um, I think the Paul is a national. I, I don't think I know what it is where you can recruit nationally as well as internationally. So that's my vision. And um, I definitely think we have a plan in place of how to get there. So now for the question that is the elephant in the room that I know all the fans um, are wondering, how long do you think it's going to take to rebuild DePaul's program and get to where your vision um, has us? 
you know, Steve, I, I don't want to exactly put an exact time frame on it. What no, I will no, 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 we need a time. I, I, need to <laughs> I tell you, what, this is what I tell recruits. I'm going to tell you exactly what I tell recruits. Sooner than later, you know, I, I don't have a, a, a three or four year plan. I have a next year plan. You know, I'm trying to win games next year with the right group of guys that you can put together and have some success right away. And, I, you know, again, not that it's short minded, but I think in this day and age, um, with the recruiting being the way it is, obviously we're, we're recruiting under pandemic now, but with the transfer portal, um, guys not having to sit out a year, I think it helps in a lot of ways that you can plug in holes sooner than later of the needs you have for your team. So again, I think we can get there sooner than later. Again, I'm looking to win next year. And when you say, okay, when coach was asked me, I'm looking to big in the thick of things in the Big East. Um, I'm looking for DePaul to come out and make a splash. And I really feel confidently that we can do that. Um, we've added some pieces so far. We do have more work to do. But, you know, with the guys we do have returning, I think we can really make a jump. Well, in your introductory press conference, you, you talked a little bit about your prior, priorities and, you know, how you wanted to have in-depth conversation with current players get on the recruiting trail, put a, a, a staff together. Can you give us a little insight and a little update on your staff? You know, we've, we've hired, a, I've hired a couple of guys and, you know, I still have a guy or two left to hire for the staff, but Paris Parham is somebody that I've been knowing probably 15 years, um, knew him when he played at Mankato. He's from Chicago, but knew him as a college player, um, was a successful high school coach in Chicago, um, has coached at Illinois State, the University of Illinois, um, Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And I just thought it was very important, obviously, to get a guy that's very familiar with the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois. And that, you know, is nationally known as well. So I think Paris covers a lot of those areas for us. Um, I'm excited to have him here. and He's been working tirelessly since he's been here. Steve Thomas. It's a part of our staff that came from Richmond, um, was at Virginia Tech prior to that, and was worked with us at Oregon for two years as a graduate assistant. Um, Steve comes from a great coaching tree, working with Dana Altman, Buzz Williams, um, Coach Mooney at Richmond. Um, he's great on the floor. He's from the Philadelphia area. So obviously being in the Big East, you know, them are areas that I really want to cover on the East Coast, up and down Philadelphia and New Jersey. D.C., New York. So I think he brings a lot to the table from a coaching standpoint and a recruiting standpoint, just as well as what Paris does. Um, Patrick Scully is our operations guy, um, came with me from Oregon, um, started off as a manager with us at Oregon, um, worked his way up as a graduate assistant, was our video guy there as our director of basketball operations now. So them are some of the guys that I've hired up to this point. Um, I'm looking to hire add another guy or two to the staff within the next week or two. And, um, you know, I just want to put the best staff that's going to work well together because that's a big part of it is your staff. And again, not from a, just from a recruiting standpoint, but from a player development standpoint, from a coaching standpoint, helping guys get better and being all in. I think that's very important to have the right staff put together that can make those things happen. So I'm very happy with where our staff is at right now. Again, adding a couple more pieces to the staff within the next couple of weeks and uh, just getting ready for when the guys get here in summer school and starting you know, right around June 14th. So, Coach, all coaches have their preference when it comes to the type of player that they want to compete on their team. What do you look for in a player when you're trying to get them to commit to DePaul? You know, I want a player that, that wants to compete. Um, that's a winner. Um, that's going to do things right on and off the court. But, you know, really guys that want to compete um, and want to win and care about winning and winning the right way, unselfishly, um, making plays for one another, um, guys that are coachable because that's a big part of it. And guys that are going to be culture guys because you, you got to build the right culture and that's a big part of it. So guys that coming come from winning programs and winning pedigrees is very, very important to me. And um, guys that are gym rats, you know, you know, you got to want to get in that gym and get better. And again, you know, we got 
two or three hours a day with them at practice, but it's got to be guys on your team that have a commitment to wanting to get in in the mornings and get extra work in, get in in the evenings and get extra work in. Because again, that's got to be the most important thing, you know, because this is their team and, and, and they got to feel that pride and um, have a sense of urgency about that. You know, I'm the coach, but, you know, I, I like a player, you know, driven team as well, where this is their team. You know, I always say, you know, there's no individual entries into the NCAA tournament. E- either we all go or none of us go. And they, they got to feel that they got to all come together. But from an individual player standpoint, guys that are driven and that want to get better and compete. I know like your, your pedigree, you haven't, you didn't take long to make a splash on the recruiting trail. I know you got an addition from Kansas, uh, a player from Oregon. Can you give us an update on your current roster? You know, we do. We, we, we've been fortunate where we've got three guys signed that we've signed. We have had another commitment from another young man that I can't speak on just yet because we haven't had this paperwork. But, you know, again, with the transfer portal um, being what it is, I think you have an opportunity to fill the needs you have on their roster. So um, start off with Jalen Terry um, from Flint, Michigan, was a young man that um, we had, I had recruited very hard to Oregon. Um, so, you know, he's a point guard. He's talented. He really can change um, the speed of the game with his quickness. So he, he's a guy that I think can come in and, and make an impact for us. Um, he's got to get a little stronger. Um, he's got to shoot the ball a little bit more consistently from the three-point line, but he he has some pieces to work with. He was a winner coming out of high school over in Flint. Obviously, he had success with us at Oregon, so that was very, very important to me. Um, Tyon Grant Foster, a young man from Kansas, um, University of Kansas, from Kansas City. Um, I recruited Tyon at Indian Hills Junior College. Obviously, we didn't get him he chose to go to Kansas, but – You know, I thought he was very talented. And what I really liked about Tyon, I thought he could play multiple positions. So that was very, very important to me, being a guy that could play the two through the four, um, could play some point in the pitch. And so I thought that was very important. So they're very excited to get him. Filming from um, South Plains Junior College from Boston is a guy that's more than just a shooter, um, can put it on the floor, can score. Um, average right at about 14 points a game this year for a very, very good South Plains junior college team. Went to the national tournament, um, played for a very good junior college coach in Steve Green. So it's a guy that, that I know coming in is going to be well coached and that I know can make the adjustment. Again, sometimes with junior college guys, it takes them a little bit longer. But with these guys getting a year back, again, he's going to have three years to play still. So that's important. Jalen will have four years and Tyon would have two years. Um, some of the guys coming back, um, David Jones, who I think is talented, um, you know, coming in in December, kind of probably was a little bit of a rush for him. I think it's hard for guys to come in mid-semester, uh, mid-quarter, whatever it may be, and make that adjustment. But um, David has worked very hard this spring. Um, I think he's got a chance to be a really, really good player. He's a guy that we had even looked at at Oregon. So, you know, we were familiar. I was familiar with his game um, and just the talent that he has and been able to play multiple positions. Um, Javon, I think is very talented, averages average 14 points this year. And again, just his versatility, um, which I think will be huge. And um, Big Nick with the talent that he has to be able to run the floor, um, block shots, you know, I think his versatility you know, I think he brings a lot to the table as well. So I, I hope I'm not leaving anybody off. But that's number just some of the guys that we signed, got committed, um, some of the guys returning. And again, um, hoping to add a couple more guys to this bunch. Well, I know when I was looking at the press releases of the guys that you had committing and, you know, guys that you got to commit from the transfer reporter and seeing a guy from Flint, Michigan, which I know is going to excite fans of DePaul because – one, if you're just a fan of college basketball, there's not too many championships that don't have some sort of connection to Flint. Uh, but you just look at DePaul's history with guys like Marty Embry, who I played with overseas, and T. Green, who I played with as a freshman. I mean, guys from Flint just know how to win, and they're tough, and they're competitive. And so, you know, seeing that kind of connection from the past into the 
the, the current was exciting for me, uh, but really all the guys, you can't put your finger on one guy that's exceptional, uh, but you can tell that, you know, you've really uh, kind of put your imprint already on this team. Um, now that you have these different players coming in from all over the country, what's the style of play that you're going to try to implement uh, for next season? You know, again, Steven, I, I really want to get up and down. You know, I, I really want to push the tempo from an offensive standpoint. You know, that's what I'm really familiar with, that's how we had great success at Oregon. So I really like to play fast and off of makes and misses of playing in transition um, and, and trying to score points. I really would like to score 78 to 84 points a game, shoot, you know, 20 to 25 threes a game. Um, obviously, teams are going to take transition away and we're going to have to be able to score in the half court. I'm a big motion guy. Um, some dribble weave stuff, um, putting guys in pick and roll situations and again, giving them a little bit of freedom to play. Um, I just want guys to make the right play and the right basketball play. I tell guys all the time that may be a good shot, but the guy in the corner may have had a great shot. So I want guys to trust their teammates, make the extra pass to the guy for the great shot. Obviously limiting our number of turnovers um, from an offensive standpoint and um, just being very efficient offensively. Defensively, I've been a big man-to-man -man guy of really trying to create points off of our defense, off of turnovers, um, getting up, trying to pressure the ball, getting deflections, um, running through passes. So that will be our primary defense. Um, but we will change up defensively, um, going from a three-quarter court press back to some two-three matchup zone, um, full court pressing at times to change the tempo of the game. And just trying to keep the offense on their heels as well, you know, trapping sometimes first pass, second passes, but really known as a team that's very scrappy, that's hard nosed, that's going to lay in on the line night in and night out. And that's what, you know, I want the Paul basketball to stand for. If when that opponent walks out of that gym where they say, hey, we don't want to play them guys no more. You know, it played too hard. You know, it was just it was just too tough. And, you know, it begins and ends, in my opinion, with defense and rebounding. You know, over the course of a 30-game season, we used to always say, you know, 10 games you're going to shoot it really, really well, 10 games you're going to shoot it average, and 10 games you're going to shoot it bad. How are you going to win those games when you don't shoot the ball well? How are you going to be able to go on the road and win that two- or three-point game? And, you know, that's something that you can rest your head on night in and night out on defending and rebounding. Them are things you can't control. You can't control whether you're going to make 25 threes or whether that ball is going to go in every night. You know, it's, the reality of it is it's not, it's not going to go in the way you want it to 30 nights. You know, you're going to get 12 nights when you just shoot it really well, but you're just going to win that game regardless. But you got to be able to scrape out those tough two or three point wins, especially in a league like the Big East where there's so much balance. So we've got to be prepared for that. So what can the DePaul fans expect to see when they, you know, that first game that, that tips off. This is what they can expect. They're going to get their money's worth. because They're going to see that a team that plays extremely hard that's going to be diving on that floor for loose balls. And that's going to play together and make the extra pass of the team that's connected, but a, a very blue collar team that's going to play very, very hard. And, you know, you know, that's who I am as a coach. Um, an intense coach, a, a guy that just wants you to lay it all on the line. And again, you know, you may come up short from time to time, but they were going to know they were in the fight that night. And um, that's what I want our guys to represent. You know, I, you know, I just going to demand that they play hard. So we all know as, as far as scheduling goes, there's a, a strategy to that as far as the buildup for your team. And, and even in, in postseason to try to get, you know, experience against those top tier teams. What's your scheduling philosophy? I'm still going through that strategy right now, Steve. So we're working through that as we speak. But, you know, playing 20 Big East games, which we know the Big East is a very tough league, and I've been doing my research. So if you can finish in the top half of the Big East from what we've seen over the course of the last seven, eight years, you've got a great chance of going to the NCAA tournament. With that being said, these young men that we're recruiting, they want to play the best. You know, they, they want to be challenged. And I think that's a big part that helps in recruiting um, and just keeping them engaged and making sure they're playing the best teams that we can possibly play. So to answer your question, 
I want to play the best teams that we can play. Um, I want to play the best teams. I want to come to Chicago as well. You know, I don't, you know, Chicago is a great city. I'm sure they want to come to Chicago. So again, we're not running from anybody. You know, we, we, we take the challenge. And again, you know, I just want to play the best, most competitive schedule that we can play at DePaul. So we know our, our new athletic director, Dwayne Peavy, came from Kentucky, you from Oregon. So can we expect to see, you know, Kentucky and, and Oregon, you know, in, in the near future? You know, let, let me know. <laughs> hey, I told Dwayne, and Dwayne has told Cal, they owe us a game, and Dana Altman owes us a game in Oregon as well. Dana Altman promised me, he said, Steph, you get the job. We will play you guys. So I'm going to take him up on that promise. When I called him the other day, he said the schedule was full for next year, maybe the following year. So he, he'll come through for us. And, um, you know, I'm sure we'll get an opportunity to get Oregon here. And I think, obviously, with Dwayne's relationship with Calipari and Kentucky, that hopefully we're blessed and fortunate that we'll get a game with them as well. But, again, we want to play the best schedule that we can play because, again, I think it helps prepare us for the Big East and it helps prepare – Different style of play, a blessed and fortunate. Hope we won the, you know, we're getting ready for the NCAA tournament to see in different styles of play from different teams as well. Are there any specific teams that you would like to see on your schedule? Or for you, it's just more of style of play and, and quality of your opponent? I, w- I wouldn't necessarily say specific teams, but just the quality of the opponent. And again, you know, I'm sure fans got certain teams that they would like to see us play. So um, I'm always open for suggestions. <laughs> But um, I just want to play the best teams that we can play that are willing to play maybe a home and home series. You know, it's just not going to be one sided where, you know, DePaul is going there and they're not really willing to return the game. So teams that are willing to play a home and home series with us, we're always um, open to going to, you know, major tournaments where we can get challenged and, you know, MTE tournaments where we can get three or four games out of it. So I'm definitely open to the scheduling, but just the best opponents that we can play they can help prepare us for league play. Well, I think we can all agree that this has been an unprecedented year for several reasons, but especially because of the transfer portal, which has really changed the dynamic of recruiting, dynamic of teams, and you know, kind of put the power in, in the player, um, which previously has really just been with the university and the coach. So what are your thoughts on the transfer portal? Well, you know, obviously, you know, it gives the young men an opportunity, you know, to go and play right away, which, you know, if that's what the rules are, I'm totally fine with that. Um, I think it's been beneficial t- for us this year of being able to go out and look at some guys that can come in and play right away. There's a lot of guys in that transfer portal. That's what I will tell you. So it, it's almost like another job or you, you're just looking at, you got to have somebody in your staff that's just watching that portal every day, all day, because you just never know when a guy's going to go in there and again, when they do go in there, you got to be on it pretty quickly because them guys are getting pulled in a lot of different directions. But I think what it's done, it, it, it gives you an opportunity to see guys play at the level that they're at to see how well it's going to translate. So, you know, again, the transfer portal is big. I don't think that's the way, only way to make a living in this. I still think there's got to be a good mix of high school kids uh, on your roster maybe a junior college kid on your roster and so forth. But, you know, I know we're looking at a lot of guys in the transfer portal right now, but I just don't think that we can just rely on the transfer portal year in and year out. I still think we got to recruit the top high school players, um, junior college players, international players who just have a, a good mix on our team. And again, use the transfer portal where there's an immediate need. So you are actively recruiting the transfer portal, though, is, is what you're saying? Very much so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, we very much so are and again just just with what we feel our needs are we feel like having more experienced guys right now that we feel that like can come in that we know can probably make an impact right away is what our primary needs are right now yeah and, and I agree with you I see the transfer portal for an established program you know can be more detrimental for someone like you that is you know trying to build something up because it's something new something fresh and as a great recruiter, as we all know that you are, um, I think you're primed to, you know, take advantage of that. So let's end on a on a fun one before we go to the listener questions. I heard you talk about the food scene in Chicago. Um, so how, 
how are you enjoying the, the food scene? I, I don't see, you know, you putting on that freshman 10 from freshmen that go to Chicago. So you look like you're keeping it active. I know you, you run a lot. So what, what's been your favorites in Chicago? I, I don't have a favorite. I have lots of favorites. I, I right. just can pinpoint one thing. Chicago has got the best food scene in the country. It's, it's hands Bar down yes. the best restaurants. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking desserts. I'm talking steak, pizza, whatever you want. It's here in Chicago. So that's something that I got to kind of, you know, slow down on because I've been doing way too much eating. I tell people all the time, um, I, I work out to eat. You know, that, that's the only reason I do all this money. That's my <laughs> quote. I love it. <laughs> I work out to eat and, and to eat cookies, cupcakes and steak and pizza, whatever it may be. So I, I'm just working out just so I can eat whatever I want. But being in Chicago, I got to be a little careful with it. But I tell you what. It's been great. It is no knock against Eugene, Oregon, but you live in Eugene, Oregon for 11 years and move to Chicago. It's kind of like you, you kind of lose your mind for a while. I, I said, I got to slow this down because I'm doing too much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no knock on Eugene outside of the, uh, you know, the Nike store, which all the um, players would hit up when we would play there in the NBA. There's not much else out there. Um, but personally, what do you have a favorite pizza yet? Uh, you know, that's that's some big, big stuff in Chicago. I'm going to say deep dish. I'm, gonna say, I'm not going to say I, I got I got it. I just love deep dish pizza. Obviously, I've been to Luminati's, Giordano's. I, I've had them all. Um, I can't say which one is the I just like them all. <laughs> well, um, since I'm not a coach, and I'm not in politics. I'm going to say Giordano's is my thing. So, OK. You know, um, but yeah. Uh, so we got our, our first uh, question from the audience. Um, do you have an update on players that signed last fall? Are any of them planning to still attend to Paul with the new coaching staff? We do it. And I'm still talking with the guys from last fall. But um, as far as right now, um, Bynum is still planning to attend from what he shared with us. Um, he's still finishing up some things for his senior year. So we're looking forward to working with him. Um, I just talked with him earlier today and he hasn't given me any indication of anything different. So I'm just looking forward to working with him. Um, I had never had a chance to see him play in person, but I've seen video of him, um, watch tape, talk to many people. So, you know, I, I know he's a very dynamic player that can score and just getting a chance, you know, to work with him, excited about that. The other young man, Brett Hart from Arizona, is planning on coming. Um, again, not a young man that I had seen play, but I've talked to a lot of people about him. Um, he can shoot the ball really, really well. Um, and I think he got a chance to be a good player, whether that's a two years down the road, three years down the road. You know, we'll have to wait and see that when I get a chance to watch him work out, you know, work him out this summer. But those are two young guys that we're excited about that we think can really help the program. Um, some of the guys that did sign early um, did ask out of their letters. And again, you know, one thing I didn't want to do, Stephen, is, you know, hold any of these guys back if they didn't feel it was the best situation for them. Um, I want to, you know, them to be happy at the end of the day. And if they felt they needed to explore the options, I totally understood that. So the guys that did ask out of their letters, we were totally OK with that. And um, just going to continue to keep working to sign a couple more guys here in the spring. So with the changes in the style of play and the emphasis on the three-point shooting, have you changed your recruiting strategy at all over the years with less emphasis on traditional big men, which I would disagree with as a former big man that she's playing, and more towards versatility and shooters? Well, you know, it, it, that's a great question. And it's funny, the way we played at Oregon, we, we never were fortunate enough to have a real dominant big guy. So we, we really spread the floor. Um, we really had skilled guys that could, could step out and shoot the, you know, the three-point shot from even big guys. We had from guys like Bo Bo and guys like that. So, you know, that's the kind of the way that I've recruited over the last 10 to 11 years of getting guys that were versatile, that could play multiple positions, and that we could really space the floor with. So um, that's kind of been I, my comfort level, and I'm hoping to do the same thing here at DePaul, we're playing that style of play. So how do you plan on making in-game adjustments and utilize your staff when it comes to those adjustments and in, in game pr preparation? 
And with some spots still to fill on your roster, are you looking for a specific type of player to fill a certain need? Well, let me, let me talk about the, the, um, the adjustments. You know, all the guys that I've hired and the guys that I'm planning on hire, I think are great coaches as well as guys that can recruit, that can develop guys. So, again, I will lean on my staff. Uh, we will meet a lot going into games for game planning. And then, obviously, you know, things change over the course of the game. So, again, I will make decisions. I will meet, lean on my staff as well to help with them decisions. So, again, they're not guys that are just one-dimensional as just being a recruiter. These are, you know, guys that I feel are really, really good basketball coaches. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out together collectively. Um, as far as players and kind of what we're looking for now, we're just looking for the best fits for what we think will help us be successful. Um, obviously, you know, we, we like to sign maybe another big guy or two possibly, um, depending on if they're guys that fit our style of play and how we want to play. And, again, guys that can we feel can open up the floor and um, skilled. And, you know, again, I'm really big on guys that are versatile, that can play multiple positions from an offensive standpoint, and that can guard multiple positions defensively. So that's just as important to me as well. So that's just from an offensive standpoint standpoint but guys that can guard multiple positions defensively so yeah we're still actively um recruiting recruiting very hard and hopefully we have some more good news coming within the next week or two well we know recently with the um a lot of restrictions have been lifted nationwide um and with your staff being able to go on the road and recruit again in person starting in the next couple of weeks do you think all of the virtual recruiting you've done for over a year will still be a part of the recruiting process? Or is that just kind of an, you know, an accessory piece of, of recruiting? You know, I think it'll be a part of the process still, Stephen, but there's nothing like being able to go out and physically watch a young man work out, playing a game, practice or whatever it may be, or even that conversation with he and his parents of building that relationship. So I think things will get back to how they were. I do think we will do, do a lot virtually as well as far as Zooming and um, FaceTiming. I'm, I've done more Zoom and FaceTime with kids over the course of the last year and a half than I've ever done in my life. So I think that is here to stay. But just from you know an evaluation standpoint of things that you can see in person that you can't quite see on tape as far as body language, um, you know, talking on the court, being vocal, you know, the exact level of athleticism, I think it's really, really going to help to be able to get back out on the road and see those things in person right there. So another question that I know um, majority of the DePaul fans are, are wondering is, what's your experience recruiting Chicago? As we know, history of DePaul has had a lot of great Chicago basketball players. So your experience in Chicago and how has been your reception uh, with the local basketball community since you've been here? Because we know recruiting in Chicago is a different beast than recruiting in other areas of the country. Well, you know, I told somebody, if you have a recruiter in Chicago, then you're probably not a really, really good recruiter. I mean, you know, no matter where you are, Chicago's always had talent. Um, they got very, very good high school coaches. So um, they got very good AAU coaches. They got great AAU program from Illinois Wolves, the Mac Irving Fire to the Mean Streets. Um, so, you know, in them, them programs have good coaches coaching those young men. The high schools in the city have good coaches in the suburbs and in the states. So I have recruited Chicago. Um, we were fortunate enough to get a young man at Oregon by the name of Paul White from Whitney Young, um, Coach Slaughter. So I have a relationship with him. Um, when I was at Cincinnati, we got a young man by the name of Deion Dixon from Crane High School. So, again, Chicago has been an area that we have recruited. Uh, being at Oregon, there wasn't a lot of great players in our state. So we had to recruit nationally at Oregon where we felt the best players were. And, you, you know, we were going to, you know, look at everywhere where we could find them. So Chicago was a place that I have recruited. The reception from the high school coaches, I think, has been very, very good. The AAU coaches. So now it's just a matter of me being visible and getting out there and working where we can get a chance to get back out. So have you and your staff talked about the name, image, and likeness rules that are changing around the country and how that could be an advantage to a place like Chicago for student athletes? You know, 
obviously we've talked about it. You know, it's something that I talked about with, with our staff at Oregon with Coach Alvin. And obviously that changes being in Chicago as opposed to being in Eugene. Um, we just don't know, obviously, all the rules and the regulations that are going to come with that. But I think there's a lot of benefits, obviously, if the rule does pass of being in Chicago with that rule. So we'll just have to see kind of how everything plays out and hopefully how it works to our advantage. But I, I think it could be very advent advantageous, yeah, advantageous to us here at the park. Do you think these potential rule changes are, are going to uh, affect the landscape of, of college basketball and athletics? I'm, I'm sure we will have some type of effect on it. Um, I'm not exactly sure exactly what it will be. Um, it's just kind of like, you know, some of these young men elect to go to the G League now and, you know, bypass their, you know, college experience, which has somewhat of an effect, but not probably what people thought it was going to have right away. But so I can't say exactly what, effect it will have, but I'm sure there will be some effect on it. I know our new athletic director, uh, Dwayne Peavy, is a fan of the old logo with uh, Billy Blue Demon. Any plans of having a game with, you know, with the old Billy Blue and, uh, you know, some old looking retro, man, I don't like saying retro because I played in those, but retro uh, uniforms. Coming from Oregon and all the different uniforms we had at Oregon, I have no problem with that whatsoever. Um, it's above my pay grade, and that's with Dwayne and, and the marketing people. But um, I have no problem with that whatsoever. Did you did you like the did you like the logo? Did, oh, I, I, I mean, we won with it, so what's not to like? But one there thing I, I will agree with you, though. I mean, you look at Baylor and Oregon. You know, their ability to utilize that kind of marketing and flashiness because players like that, I thought, really was a big boon for them you know, kind of moving up the ranks and, and getting players because players, you know, they, you, you play how you look and if you feel good, you play good. And, and, you know, it goes with that. So those are great marketing tools. Another question that we have is, are there any, are there any plans to play a round robin schedule with the other division one Chicago colleges, Northwestern UIC, Loyola, Chicago state, like a, you know, like the big five in Chicago, um, you know, make it maybe take it one more, one step further and make it into a tournament or, or a classic? You know, I, I'm not sure. But, you know, one thing I will tell you, you know, Dwayne coming from Kentucky was um, very big in their scheduling and um, kind of how they went about it. And he was very involved in that. So if there's a person that probably could get it done, it would be Dwayne Peavy. But again, I, um, I haven't been a part of no conversations, but I definitely would be open to it. So do you have any uh, plans of having a summer basketball camp for high school and elementary school kids? And if so, are you going to have any former players come to help out? You know, we, we, we'd love to have, you know, we, we've talked about having a camp. Um, I don't know if we can get it going this summer, but we definitely do plan on having a camp in the future. Um, that's something that, you know, I did talk to Dwayne about when I got the job. And again, that's a way of the community getting the chance to know our players former players, and just being involved in the community as well with those young kids. So we definitely want to have a camp and um, look forward to it one day. So what are some of the differences that you notice between the Big East style of play versus Pac-12 style of play who, you know, I got to tip my hat to the Pac-12 because they were kind of the laughing stock for a while, but they really came, came with it during this, this past NCAA tournament. You know, I think we're the, the laughing stat because some of them games come on so late in right. these areas that a lot of you people don't get a chance to see some of the teams in the Pac-12 to realize how talented those teams were. But to answer your question, um, I think the Big East is a more physical league um, than, than what I think the Pac-12 is. Um, I think the Pac-12 is a more open league with a little bit more scoring involved, but they're both very, very good leagues. Um, obviously, you know, Villanova's had great success in this league. Um, so, you know, I'm, when I was in the Big East, when I came to Cincinnati, it was a very tough league. I mean, we were winning games sometimes or losing games 48 to 51. So it wasn't a lot of points being scored. So you had to be tough, physical, and you had to be able to defend. But, um I think there's a lot of similarities in the league, but if I had to say one major difference, I think the Big East is a little bit more physical of a league than what the Pac-12 is. 
So coach, you touched on this earlier with your experience on building programs and, and being in programs that, you know, kind of had to start from scratch. And one of those was Cincinnati. And with your experience at Cincinnati, when they joined the Big East, um, is that going to help you adjust, you know, since you've been around the league before, as, as well as your experience on building, uh, building programs? Well, I think as far as building programs, being at Cincinnati and Oregon, that that definitely will help. Um, the Big East has changed the landscape a little bit from when I was there, when I was at Cincinnati of some of the teams that are no longer in the league. But I'm, I'm familiar with the Big East. I'm familiar with the areas, obviously recruiting up and down the East Coast when I was at Cincinnati, I think will help. But the, just as far as style of play, I don't know if that necessarily will help me a lot because, you know, there's a lot of different coaches that are at these programs now that were there when I was at Cincinnati. What has been the biggest adjustments for you from being an assistant coach to a head coach thus far? I would probably say my time management. Um, you, you know, so far, just, you know, I think you can find yourself getting pulled in a lot of different directions. But, you know, one thing I'm trying to tell myself is, you know, I, I am the basketball coach and we got to put the best team out there that we can put out there. So I can't forget what I'm here to do. And that's, you know, to be the basketball coach, to put the best players out there to make the best team. So I've tried to stay really, really focused and locked in on that as well as build relationships with the guys that are returning and their families and the people involved with them. So I think that's been the biggest thing. It's just, you know, time can get away from you a little bit. You look at eight or nine o'clock and go, really, what did we get done today? What, what have I gotten done? Or there's still much more to get done. Yeah, I think people don't realize the difficulties and the, and the time constraints of being a, a college um, coach at, at any level. I mean, you guys burn it up at, at both ends. Um, what was your biggest challenge last season with the players and teams being isolated? You know, it was an unprecedented year as we've talked about um, being isolated during the season in order to try to play games. You know, I, I think the biggest challenge was trying to keep the guys focused. When, when we went into that last year, we knew there was gonna be some bumps in the road and um, there was gonna be some cancellations before the game, the day before the game. And, you know, them things were going to be out of our control, but we knew the teams that could handle this best and um, stay positive would be the teams that would have the most success throughout the course of the year. So again, it wasn't going to do no good to complain about the situation. We're just blessed and fortunate to be able to have a season one. And again, we knew there was going to be some bumps in the road. So again, if there was going to be a pause, just responding positively from that pause, getting ready to play when we were able to play again. And again, it was just like going to the NCAA tournament, you know, in that bubble and being there, you know, for two and a half weeks, it, it, you know, it was a little tough on guys, but again, being in that bubble situation was much better than not being in the, in, playing the NCAA tournament the year before. So again, just staying positive, trying to stay connected with the guys and, and keep them busy and keep their minds busy because again, this was a very tough situation for them as well. You know, it, nothing was normal for them as far as, you know, not going to class, everything online. Um, a lot of them, you know, living by themselves, you know, not really having roommates, you know, just because of the contact tracing. So just making sure they mentally were okay. So we have a lot of DePaul alumni, season ticket holders, fans listening tonight. What's your message to them? This is my message to them. Um, we, we will get this program back on track. You know, I'm going to work tirelessly. Our staff is going to work tirelessly to get this program back on track to make you all proud alums. When March Madness comes around that you're wearing your T-shirt and you're proudly wearing your T-shirt around Chicago, and you guys are going to be proud Blue Demon fans again. And that's my number one goal. And, again, that's what it's been when I was at Cincinnati, when it was when I was at Oregon. And, you know, when I built them relationships with those former alums, because, Stephen, at the end of the day, you guys are a big part of what built this program and built this program up. So I owe that all to you all and for Dwayne giving me this opportunity at DePaul to work tirelessly to make those things happen. And I can tell you, we're going to lay it all on the line 
and give it everything we got to make it happen. So what is the support of the fans and alumni and boosters um, mean for you as a new head coach of DePaul? It, it, it means a lot to me because, again, you guys have all seen the great days of what DePaul basketball can be. And, again, there, there's been some great days, um, again, watching it on WGN, you know, the pros that have come through DePaul, the success that DePaul has had. So um, – it's very big that the alums are very involved. I want all the alums to be involved. I want to get a chance to meet everybody. And again, the city of Chicago and, and being Chicago's team. So them are things that are all very important to me, but I need you all support to help get there as well and to get behind us. Well, I, I, I know uh, you met my mom on Mother's Day and you're the first coach since I left DePaul that she's met and she gave her you know, approval. So that I know that was big for her. So if that's any indication of, you know, the future of the Paul, I'm excited about it, but I just want to thank you for your time today. I want to thank everybody who has tuned in to watch this and to, and that have submitted their question. I know I'm excited about the future of DePaul athletics with you running the men's program. And, and I can't wait for, for tip off. Um, so thanks. Thanks again, coach Stubblefield. And, and, and again, thank for everybody who, who tuned in and, and those who support DePaul basketball. We're going to need your support more than ever this year with, you know, a new direction, a new journey um, and a new vision with coach Stubblefield. So tune in. I, I know coach is going to have a lot of new um, additions and, and exciting announcements in the future. So yeah, tune into a DePaul athletics. And, and again, thanks coach Stubblefield. And, and I appreciate your time. No, thank you so much for having me. And we're looking forward to working hard and getting this thing turned around. I, I promise we're going to do everything in our power to make it happen. Let's uh, go. Let's go.